the research work that we've done here at Reading involving visually impaired people um, has um, developed guidance, for instance the light reflectance values and other things, which uh, have a particular user focus. But what we've also found is that within all of these research projects we've also involved people uh, with full sight. And what we've found is that the findings which are applicable to visually impaired people, for instance in terms of their uh, requirement for reasonable contrast, are also helpful uh, to people with full vision. And in this way, we're not just helping a two million uh, proportion of the whole population, we're actually helping everybody to use buildings much more effectively. And we can only do that with some certainty if we've carried out the research. Now, fortunately in this area we have done, and therefore it does have benefits. And I think in some small way, before the research work findings were available, people were a bit unsure as to how much contrast to provide, which perhaps led designers to produce schemes which were uh, rather garish, with large differences in light reflectance value. With the research work that we've produced, they can be moderated, although 30 points seems a lot. It is um, able to produce really quite pleasant schemes, which, whilst helpful to visually impaired people, are indeed helpful for the general population. From the perspective of how the standard BS8493 and the underpinning research work, how that's going to be applied, Having now got a standard which um, companies um, can, and indeed many are, uh, already fully understanding and beginning to apply, from the specifier's point of view, uh, it should now be routine for all of the materials that you're going to select to be measured in accordance with that standard and provide the specifier with the light reflectance values. Now, clearly the standard's only been out for a year or just over. Uh, in that case, some companies are getting to grips with providing that information. But the long-term view is that this will be a routine part of the uh, surface information which uh, material manufacturers would provide to specifiers. So there would be no need to ask. And also, in terms of regulatory reform, uh, where someone needs to assess whether in fact the minimum requirement has been met, it will be relatively easy for the specifier to say, I've selected these two materials, this is the light reflectance value of one, this is the light reflectance value of the other, the difference is more than 30 points, therefore we consider that it meets the requirements of approved document M and will also of course provide a reasonably pleasant environment for everyone. In terms of the developments of the standard, uh, BS8493 came out over a year ago. Um, I am in the process of making revisions to that. Now, there's no need to be too alarmed about that because the, the um, measurement equipment isn't changing. But what we've found over the year is that the sample sizes, depending on the material, for instance, carpet tiles come in a standard size, ceramic tiles for walls and so on come in a standard size. We've tried to include those standard sizes within the standard, so people don't have to make particular sample sizes just for the standard. Now certainly in the ceramics industry, as an example, uh, the samples are available in very small sizes only. So what we're in the process of doing is modifying BS8493 to include smaller size samples so that the, it becomes even more applicable to a wider range of samples which are readily available in particular sizes. So this should further encourage uh, the development of the adoption of the standard. Now at the moment the um, draft for comment has been out. We've had very few comments the standard is now in the process of being revised and I would anticipate that early in 2010 the new version of the standard would be applicable. But for all of those companies and so on using the older standard, 
those standard sizes and the method of measurement don't change. But with the new standard, there will be greater opportunity to include a wider range of sample sizes, and therefore it should encourage its adoption. Research work uh, that we've carried out here in Reading uh, within the Research Group for Inclusive Environments has had clearly a particular focus on colour, uh, but it's also concentrated uh, to a large degree on the lighting provision uh, for visually impaired people with um, quite an extensive range of research projects looking at task lighting, office lighting and um, rather originally looking at emergency lighting provision for visually impaired people. Uh, whilst they're trying to evacuate the building, stressful time, uh, lighting and actually contrast can help because of course when the lights the lighting fails and you're on emergency lighting you don't have much light so therefore the, the, the importance of contrast in the built environment in the passageway or the rooms that you're in is really vitally important. And then we introduce smoke <laughs> into these escape routes and uh, Although one would expect that that doesn't happen, when you analyse the fire statistics, in many cases escape routes are uh, logged with smoke. And uh, again, that emphasised the need for uh, good directional lighting and good contrast. And a supplementary to that was looking at uh, emergency safety signs, which uh, we managed to use a corridor here at the university, which is over 48 metres long so that even people with good vision, with that sort of distance, the signs were fairly small, uh, found it very difficult to identify them. And we were looking there at you know, the information that's provided, how good is the contrast on the sign, how legible and conspicuous are they. And the other uh, large area of work that we've done is looking at visually impaired people in their own homes. That's been funded by uh, a charity called the Pocklington Trust and we've examined 57 of their homes and questioned visually impaired people in them and it's led to the development of a design guide for visually impaired people in their homes which again is becoming more widely accepted it's only been out for a year or so so that gives a flavour of that now the other thing that we do here at Reading is make sure that our research work gets into our teaching and uh, I am involved in running an MSc in inclusive environments where the work that we've done here at Reading and our colleagues elsewhere around the UK uh, contribute to that programme. So it helps to keep the uh, research focus here and in some small way to make the built environment uh, more accessible to a larger number of people. I've been working here at Reading for um, almost 20 years and um, Within that time, um, I've covered a wide variety of research projects. Uh, during the time here, I've clearly become involved in British Standard Committees, uh, in particular the BS8300, which came out in 2001. My lighting interests, although obviously based in the UK, have enabled me to take an active role in the Commission Internationale de l'Eclage, the International Lighting organisation where I worked in Division 3 which looks at interior lighting and applications and I'm currently involved with that organisation in producing uh, what will be an international technical report looking at uh, the way that lighting can assist to make buildings accessible and that's part of a CIE code. On the way um, I've produced a few books based on um, buildings and their application and more recently uh, a book concerned with colour, contrast and lighting which addresses um, some of the issues raised by Project Rainbow but uh, more wider in terms of the lighting provision because it's, I think it's important that there is a one-stop place for designers and others to go to to get that sort of information. Mm -hmm.